Uh, my name is Jose E. Guzman Colon, um, a.k.a. Putanesca. Born and raised in Puerto Rico, um, with a, a tribe of crazy, wonderful Latins and Latinos and Latinas came to the States at a very young age. I got lost a lot in the drag that was going on on television, Kiss to Donna Summer, to watching everybody on Soul Train and watching these women with their you know side swept hair and their dance skin outfits and their big shoes and all that stuff. Also helping my sisters get ready for their their school dances and helping them pick out their dance skin outfits because <laughs> you know they are Puerto Rican, so I will say we love the flash <laughs> and the skin. So and I would always add that extra touch, you know, <laughs> like the flower on the side of the hair, i.e. Donna Summer, side swept hair, you know, like from watching it on Soul Train or whatever. So one day my mother decided to go grocery shopping and we lived in this two-story apartment building and there was like a little area of grass in the front. I remember the kids playing and, and, and they were all screaming for me to go play and I was like, I don't know. I didn't want to play with them. It was like, and I remember going through my mind. It was like one of those like seventies, like, like, I don't know, like I don't want to say porn, <laughs> like seventies. It was like you know, like the, like the, the windows and the curtains and everything was soft and glowy and and I just remember going through like, you know, her closet and uh, putting on a dress of hers and it was it was weird. It just felt like. I wanted to be like radiant as they were and this was my chance. I remember because I had long curly hair back then and I put rollers in my hair and then I started playing with her makeup and you know threw a little genite splash and this, you know, <laughs> I ran over by the window and I remember like turning on a track player back yeah. then. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those greatest disco a track tapes and I, I oh god I, I don't even remember the song like lip sync for your life songs and I remember like opening the window and putting the speaker out there and all the kids were looking up and I was totally lip syncing to the song and they were all like you know screaming and cheering for me and it went on it just seemed like it went on forever and then all of a sudden like I turned around and then I went to go do something to go change the music and I came back and all the kids were like still and I was still carrying on. And then in the corner of my eye, I see my mother with the shopping bags looking up. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah. And, um, and then I was, like, I was like in panic mode. I was trying to put everything back. And as soon as I was putting everything back, she came into the room. And my mother loved to wear candy wooden shoes. Oh, candy. Yeah. yeah. Candy. They were hard. <laughs> and um, she was so pissed off. And I don't know if it was because she knew that I was gay or it was because I was wearing her clothing. But she threw that freaking candy shoe and it flung across the room. I don't necessarily, I want to believe she wasn't really aiming at my head, but it did hit my head a little bit. Um, so that was like this beginning of this love-hate relationship with drag. You know, it's that thing like drag has been one of those things that it allows me to release myself. You know, I don't drink, I don't use drugs, um, I just, you know, drag is my drug. So tell us a little bit about the process, like how do you start, where... For me, I think it's it's the whole um, ritual of um, drag is, is very, it's calming and relaxing because uh, naturally I'm very spastic the way that I think. So to me, to actually get the makeup out, to get um, the mirror, to the shaving, the moisturizing, the sitting here listening to some, you know, Susie and the Banshees, some New Order, some alternative thing that's going to, like, inspire me to create. Um, to me, it's, it's, it's almost like it's very meditative. And um, it takes a few days to get it all together. And then, you know, for me, it takes three hours to get the makeup on. I know some queens can do it in 15 minutes, but, honey, I have photographed you, and I know what the difference between 20 minutes and three hours does for the camera. So... <laughs> The process is amazing for me because it's it's something, it's mine. Nobody else can come in that space between me and the mirror and what's in front of me as far as the makeup and stuff. I guess I, what, I, what I wanted to talk about was the fact that in, in drag culture, as I know it, um, that drag is something that is, um, it's a very powerful tool for men and women, um, for drag queens, for drag kings for faux kings and faux queens for everything in between all suits a purpose for me drag is therapeutic you know not just the getting ready part but 
I've heard it so many times from fans and colleagues in this community of drag that people have these really crappy days. Life happens. And to me, when you go to a drag show, it's, it's almost like the sparkle dust gets blown all <laughs> over the place. And you're so connected and you're in that, you're rooting for that queen or king. And it may inspire you to either keep going and supporting, which is really important. I, I really strongly urge that everybody support their fellow queens, you know, um, because it's, it's a lot of hard work. And it's a lot of love that goes into it. Most of us queens are broke, so please uh, support us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the cost of all the costumes and the wigs. Oh, and the yeah. Makeup, yeah. Oh, yeah. Through so many years of being broke that I've learned to make things out of nothing. That's where the art directing and all that stuff comes from for me. The styling. You can go out in the backyard and I can make you a wig out of... Grass. Grass <laughs> or, you know, like feathers on the ground and we can make eyebrows out of yeah. that make lashes out of petals and get some garbage bags and make your dress mm -hmm. and make it look like a million bucks so I feel like I'm gifted in that sense that I've been fortunate enough to um, be inspired by just elements and things around me you know I owe that a lot to I, I used to live with Glamour and, and Glamour always would sit here and stitch and smoke and eat a skittles and all that stuff and and just create beautiful costumes and and create beautiful drag and really had a great attitude about drag and culture and what it does for self i got sober in the east coast and and i was really focused on that and then my life was just changing and i wanted a big change and i didn't know what it was and i i remember watching like uh, going to wigstock watching Lady Bunny and all those queens in New York City and just thinking like there's something there for me, there's something there, but I was so afraid to get it out. I remember my friend Mo at the time, she was really involved with the drag king scene and she was doing stuff with, you know, Mistress for Mike and a bunch of other people and I was like, wow, she can do it. She looks freaking amazing and then I think I have, I, I should be doing something. I just felt like I should be throwing this, I, it's in me and I should be doing it on that level. Uh, I, I moved to Provincetown and actually she was there and she was doing drag king stuff and I was hanging out with Ryan Landry and uh, Pandora, aka Christine now, she's my mm. drag mother, became and is my drag mother. Provincetown really was very gentle with me about drag, that it was fun and that it was creative. It was towards the end of the summer and I remember she got me in drag, just carry on and get kicky. And then I remember my first thing was I was Cha Cha Charo because I looked like this cracked out version of Charo, <laughs> you know. And I think was, I saw you there. <laughs> and it was just really fun, and it was just great and very uncomfortable. But I knew that thing when you publicly do drag that way for the first time, and that adrenaline, and totally lost the contest. But it, who cared? It was just wonderful, and it was an amazing experience. And then I, I was just doing it. I started doing it more and more. I ended up coming out here. For somebody like me, I was really turned on to San Francisco by um, a few things, but the last thing that I was really inspired by was Armistead Maupin's Tales of the City. I remember that house and Miss Madrigal and like all these colorful people thinking like, oh my God, that's so cool. I would love to live in an environment where it's like that, you know, this community and living in a cool building and all that stuff in San Francisco. Just thoughts, but never thought like something like that would even... A, a reality. A reality, yeah. you know? I came here and it so happened that they had an extra room, really weird. Mm. And, you know, I met Stefan, a.k.a. Heklina. That really changed and altered my world. As soon as I met, let's say, Heklina, my lady friend, <laughs> turned me on to Tranny Shack. I, I felt like I finally found my tribe of people. Mm -hmm. It was like no longer these triangles going through circles. Mm. Being in the back of the room, it was like in it. I was with my people. There was drag queens, drag kings, faux queens, faux kings, just the hot messes, the good messes too. I started performing there probably like the towards the end of the first year or the beginning of the second year of Tranny Shack. It was just amazing because we really all supported each other and it was just really fun and it was scary and it was very kind of competitive at the same time and and just really amazing creatures were, were performing there, you know, from Animatronic, from the Scissor Sisters. Uh, Stephen Price, um, a.k.a. Steve Lady, who passed away, and it's just was the most incredible, incredible uh, performer. 
Um, Robbie D, who was the DJ who started helped start Tranny Shack with Hecklina, aka Gerber Jones. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And uh, and of course, I met Peaches Christ there, and we became really good friends as well. You know, I think it's it's that thing. It's called community, and feel like I found that, and and I have that because. Through drag, it's opened up this gateway of being able to have open dialogue about things that you normally wouldn't be able to have with the average Joe. Because, I mean, like, if you're in a room with a bunch of queens and you're naked, you're getting ready, you you know each other's flaws, and you know each other's ferocities and all these things, it's, it becomes like family and a lot of magic come doing drag and tranny shack and midnight mass. For me through tranny shack, I got to do a lot of really credible numbers that, that have lifted me um, out of depression or through the loss of my best friend, Sarah, that was a really huge deal for me. I remember like before she died, I was, I had all the sciatica stuff and I was really depressed and I was like laid out. When you're put in that situation, you, you, there's nothing perky going on in your life. You're depressed because you can't move. And uh, she was going through her chemo and all that stuff. And I just remember talking to her and we would talk about like for, I thought it was for her. You know, just to kind of get her out of her funk and, you know, she had... So I was like single mom, living her dream as a teacher and just gorgeous, just sitting there trying to inspire each other. And then I got this thing, like I got back into my music while I was laying there and I just went back to that place of where do I go? How do I get out of self when I'm so down? And I remember go back to that place of inspiration when I was a teen and I was in a really dark place about things and all these bands that inspired me. There was a song, it's called Last Beat of My Heart by Susie and the Banshees, a tearjerker. It's really emotional. I remember the first time I did uh, the performance, I, I did it as this like priestess, like a high priestess, all in white. And then I had these two Buto people in the back, all white. And there was, they were under sheets and strobes. And that was us when we get to heaven at the end we meet. It's still emotional talking Mm, about it because when she finally died, her mom called me and said, how amazing was it to have you in her life? And it was just beautiful because she was, she was so honored. She was honoring her daughter, honoring her friends. And then she, she said, which was something that just, you know, she was like, it was so, what a gift to have this child brought into this world. And, and I got to hold her in my arms and then what a gift to be able to be there for my child and still hold her on her last breath Mm. wow wow (laughs) wow so so that's Mm. why the song last beat of my heart Mm. was like kind of like a dedication to her the few days later i was doing a tranny shack and i just remember there's a bright light and performing and just feeling her and seeing Mm, her in that light. I think for me, there's so much truth and drag in what we do. The reality is, I'm very honest about this kind of stuff because there are kids out there that don't have a clue, that feel like they're not good enough for anything, or that they're bullied, or they're involved in drugs, or alcohol, or anything that, you know, is taking them out of themselves. I'm here to say that this may not be for you, for the ones that it may be for. It's, it's the greatest thing that can ever come into your life. It makes you like a superhero. And, and I don't mean that in an egotistic way. It just makes you big, and, you know, like, like we call Poya the Glamazon because it's, <laughs> you're glamorous and you're a big, big old woman, you know, and heels and big hair. And um, so there's strength to this. You know, it's empowering, you know, historically speaking, it's, I mean, think about it. It was a drag queen that threw that first brick at Stonewall. Drag has literally saved my life on so many levels. I was asking you how you got your name. I remember Ryan Landry asking me, like, what did I feel like in drag? And I said, like, a real puta. (laughs) And within seconds, he was like, Nesca, puta Nesca. So, all due respect, he gave me my name. And, um, (laughs) yeah, it's kind of like... You know, but it's a it's a whore of a dish. It's a delicious sauce that the whores used to make for their Johns. So I'm a whore of a dish. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and um, it's funny. We were on Jerry Springer one time, and they were like, 
bring out Nessa because I wouldn't say Putanesca. Meanwhile, everybody's like, you bitch, you whore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. That's 